Hi, thank you all so much for having me and giving me the opportunity to talk. And I want to say hello to my patients out there. I see a few of them there. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so as Candace said, the point of this talk is that children and adolescents do develop lupus. And we think that the total number is about 20% of people with lupus develop it in either childhood or in adolescence. And so as pediatric rheumatologists, this is an important part of our, you know, of our care. And so, and as lupus is a lifelong disease, we are trying to figure out better ways of how to transfer kids with lupus over to the adult side. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And then Dr. Derek Todd is going to follow up from the adult side. So I'll be concentrating on the pediatric side of things. So I want to talk a little bit about childhood onset lupus. So how is it similar? How is it different from what Dr. Leatherwood has talked about so far? And then just to talk about, is transition difficult? And what do we know? We've studied this a little bit between uh, Boston Children's and the Brigham's Lupus Center. So we'll talk a little bit about what we've learned from that. And then I'll talk a little bit about strategies for effective transition, and then uh, opening it up for any questions or comments. So how is, this, how is this disease different, and how is it similar? So first, Dr. Lobo did such a nice job describing how someone can be diagnosed with lupus in terms of the different signs and symptoms, the skin disease, the renal disease, the blood tests. As it turns out, those criteria work in kids and in adolescents as well. So we use that same system to diagnose. So it's similar in a lot of ways. And actually, we use a lot of the same medicines, although we do use them a little bit differently. The doses tend to be different because all medications in kids and adolescents are based on weight, whereas adult, it's more standardized. And I think what's really important is that this is still a chronic disease, whether you're 13 or you're 50. And so the struggles that accompany that are, are similar in the pediatric group. <laughs> so is it different? It is different in some ways. So when they've looked at populations of kids and adolescents with lupus and compared it to adults, as it turns out, the kids tend to be a little bit sicker. So they are more likely to have kidney involvement, and they tend to get it early. Okay. So in one study, we looked at over 50% of kids had renal disease that they developed when they were still in the pediatric population. <clears throat> and they're also a bit more likely to develop lupus in either the brain or the spinal cord. Okay, so they're more likely to have that. And the other important thing to note is that because the disease starts younger, and as everyone is now living longer with this disease, they're more likely to have increased damage because they've had it for longer. So, Children and adolescents are inherently different from adults, right? So they're going through really important periods of growth and development. So this really has to be taken into account when you're sitting in a clinic room with a patient with lupus, okay? So adolescents are adolescents. I don't know how many of you in the room, we've all been adolescents at one point. Some of you might be raising adolescents, okay? So this is a very special time of life. Um, <laughs> and in some ways, rebellion is a bit normal for them, okay? And so the conversations that I have with my patients is that I really ask them not to rebel in the form of not taking their medicines, okay? If all the things they can do to establish their rebellion, I ask them not to do that. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So why are adolescents different? So they're undergoing a lot of tasks, okay? So they have developmental things that they have to do. They have a lot of hormones. And in the setting of all that, they're trying to accomplish things in their social spheres, in academics, um, and they're developing their self-identity. So this is really important to think about if we're talking about prednisone in an adolescent and it affects your appearance, we have to sit down and we have to talk about that, okay? Because they are forming what they think of themselves in that time frame, okay? And as I said, rebellion to some degree is somewhat normal, so they're trying to separate from the from the adults around them, okay? And this is normal, and you're just trying to make sure that you work with them in a way that that's safe. And interestingly enough, I don't know why evolution did this to us, but the brain is one of the last organs to fully develop, okay? So, the point of this slide is that these are four brains, okay? This is a five-year-old, preteen, so 11 to 12. This is a teenager, and this is a 20-year-old. This is the back of the brain and this is the front of the brain. What the colors mean is that the red and the yellow are immature and the blue and purple are mature. 
So, the five-year-old looks the way you'd think, right? A lot of the brain is immature. <laughs> and the 20, yeah. and the 20-year-old looks great. The problem is the teenager is not there yet, okay? So it is normal for this part of the brain in a teenager to not be fully mature. And this is the part of the brain that helps you make long-term decisions, okay, and to understand the consequences of your actions, okay? So this is actually normal, okay? So, and this also helps you control your impulses. This is the front part of your brain, and this is the last to myelinate, okay? So this is important. As pediatricians, when we sit down in a clinic room with an adolescent, this is what I think about, okay? Okay. And then adolescents with lupus, in addition to everything else that we just talked about that applies to everybody, adolescents with lupus are dealing with medications that can be scary, okay, and affect your appearance and can be complicated up to two to three times per day while you're trying to go to high school and do your activities and live your life. Your, oops, sorry. Your appearance can be changed by the steroids. And again, in that, that frame of that you're developing your self-identity this should be talked about and, and sort of addressed head on. And then they have like little things like appointments, so they're getting pulled out of class and pulled out of their activities and their friends are not because they have to go see the doctor. So this is a really complicated time for these patients. So with that background in terms of talking about, you know, what is it like to be an adolescent with lupus, um, I want to talk about transition. So this is a process whereby we as pediatric rheumatologists we hopefully try our best to successfully transition the person over to the adult side of things, okay? And the goal, there's a specific goal. What we're really trying to do is we're trying to make sure that that patient gets integrated into the adult system. They feel comfortable, they know who to call, they know where to get their refills, okay? This is really important. And it's complicated because it's medical records being sent. It's what phone number do I call? It's how do I talk to the nurses if I'm not feeling good, okay? And when does one do this? So there's no set process for this, which is one of the things that we're gonna talk about. So sometimes the teenagers in the room are sick and tired of the screaming babies in the waiting room, okay? And they just don't wanna to come to a pediatric hospital anymore. They don't like the murals, they don't like the bright colors, okay? And they wanna go on. And so they'll transition earlier. They will say to us, you know, I'm 17, I'm, I'm ready. And so we will transition them then. For other patients, that's not, that isn't where they are. That isn't how they feel about it. And they'd rather stay, sometimes it's until they finish college, because college is a big transition and there's a lot of you know, moving parts within that and they don't want to include changing their doctor in that setting. So really it's any time between 16 and I would say like early 20s. So it's both patient dependent, it's also provider dependent. And the only other thing that comes up sometimes is that as pediatricians, we don't take care of pregnancy. So if a patient becomes pregnant um, with lupus, that will sometimes trigger a transition that otherwise might not have happened at that time. So can this be hard? Why are we talking about this? So yes, this can be hard, okay? Um, lupus is a complicated disease. Being an adolescent is complicated. Transferring care is complicated, okay? So this, if, if this isn't done well, there are consequences for health. So it can be hard. And unfortunately, as a healthcare system, I don't think we've done a great job with this. I don't think we have done enough to make this a smooth and easy process for the patients. We're hoping to start addressing that. And the, the other thing just to sort of note that patients have come back and told me is that this is not just a logistical process. This is not just who do I call, where do I get my refills, how do my records get sent. This is actually an emotional process of recognizing I was developed, you know, I developed lupus as an adolescent and I've been with this doctor now the whole time and now I have to change care. And so it's not always straightforward. And just to say, I think that there are differences in approach to care between adult and pediatric providers. This is not a judgment thing. There's no right or wrong way to do this. I think it has to do a little bit with the fact that as pediatricians, we're aware of that brain thing, okay? <laughs> that adolescents are sort of in a different place than adults, and so that might be part of it. But I think it's important to sit down with patients and say, things will likely feel different when you're in an adult hospital. 
So what do we know about this? So Dr. Kostenbader and I um, decided to look at our own population of patients at the Brigham Lupus Center to figure out what this looks like. So we went through the charts and we identified 50 adults who were seen in the Lupus Center but who were diagnosed with lupus in either childhood or in adolescence. And then what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at those three years after they transitioned over to the adult side of things and figure out how did they do? How did it go? And because the goal of this is we wanted to identify what can we do better. So this was a pretty standard lupus population. So as I said, 20% of people with lupus develop it in childhood and adolescence. They were, most of them were around age 14 when they first were diagnosed. And they were around 19 when they got over to the lupus center, when they transitioned their care to the adult side. 90% were female. Again, this is what we've talked about already so far today. And fortunately, about half of them transitioned from children's, from the hospital that I work at, so I could look at those records too and figure out um, some more information about these patients. So who were these patients? So we've talked a little bit about how lupus can affect different parts of the body, your skin, your kidneys, your brain, your joints. And so as clinicians, when we sit down with patients, we look at them in clinic and we, we can figure out how much disease activity they have. We can say, we can give that a score. And the point of that number is to give us a sense of how much disease activity is going on. So that's what that, this number is. So a sleet eye, that's just the name of the activity index, gives you a sense of how, how active is the lupus. So four to five is moderate. Okay, so these were patients who had ongoing lupus activity in the midst of their transition. So unfortunately, there was an average of nine months between their last pediatric visit and their first adult visit. This is way too long, okay? Patients with lupus need to be seen regularly. They need to get their refills. They need to have someone take a look at them in their labs. So nine months is too long, okay? And this was only the average. And the other thing we wanted to get a sense is, you know, how often do patients go to their appointments once they've transitioned? So one of the things that we wanted to look at was how often do people go for six months with no visit? And we call that a gap in care because they should be seen at least every six months. And over 70% had gone over six months without seeing a provider, okay? And the other thing that I think was important and helpful for us on, on the provider side of things to know is that depression and anxiety were frequently reported in this group. So by the end of the three years, after they'd switched their care from pediatric to the adult side, over a quarter of them reported that they were either feeling sad or a little anxious, okay? And this is important for us to know. So what did we learn? So I think as a pediatric provider, I, I felt like I learned that I really have to do a much better job of helping my patients get over to the adult side of things. So they get over faster. Um, what happened to their medicines during that time where they were not being seen by a physician? Okay, we've talked so much about how it's so important to take your medicines, take them consistently, don't miss doses, control your lupus. So we worry when patients don't have refills, okay? And then in terms of the depression and anxiety, I think we should recognize that that's a potential problem and offer support and make, and make outreach for this. So what can we do? There are things that we can do to make this work a little bit better. So there's actually, because so many adolescents who develop not just lupus as a chronic illness, there's other chronic illnesses in childhood. There's cystic fibrosis, there's type one diabetes. All of those kids are now going into the adult world. And so transition is becoming like a healthcare topic. And there is a, like a national organization called Got Transition that talks a lot about this. And they actually think that providers should start talking with their patients at the age of 12. So I don't generally do that. I usually do it when they're like, you know, adolescents, when they're 15, 16, 17. And I want to talk with them about what their goals are and what they want, what they need from me to make this go smoothly. And the other thing is that we can help with self-management skills. So what does that mean? So adolescents, so when, the, when, the, when my patients turn around 16, when they come to clinic, I ask them, not the parent, what medications are you on? Do you know the names of them? Do you know the doses? Do you know why? Let's sit down and talk about that. Because I want them to feel like they own that medication list and they know what's there and they know why. Okay? It starts at 16. I'm not saying it's done at 16. Okay? You start the conversation at 16 and then it continues. 
I also ask them to make their own appointments and we talk about refills. So Walgreens, CVS, these pharmacies have apps on your phone where they help you figure out, do I need a refill? Should I call my doctor? Just to make it a little bit easier. These are all self-management skills. And then there's details. That, so I feel like part of my job is to identify an appropriate clinic, an appropriate provider, give them the phone number, check back with them, did you make an appointment, um, help them with the medical records, because medical records are really important. Lupus is a complicated disease. You don't want to be walking into that first appointment and them not knowing anything about you. And I also, I also advocate, I think it helps to have an introductory letter to be sent from the pediatric provider to the adult provider so that they know um, who is this patient coming in to see me and what is their history. So that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for listening.